Let's get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, iPad Resema. This is the first meeting of the year, but we'll meet every Thursday this, at this time, 4.30. Uh, but we'll usually be downstairs in room 255, two floors down, just in the corner of the building now. Uh, today, um, up here, we have four centers from Oxford, who is a plant category theory for functional programming, uh, but has Sorry, a long time ago. Um, yes, this is some really interesting work on um, looking at um, game theory through some notion of, of some notion of composition game theory and structuring things through this neural category. So he's been working on that for the past few years and can tell us about the latest progress. But also, no, I'm not going to tell you about the latest progress. I'm going to tell you about three years ago progress. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> optimized for presenting it after three years. Um, Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to tell you about compositional game theory. Um, so the background I'm assuming for everyone here is that everyone knows what a monoidal category is and what a string diagram is. Does anyone not know that stuff? So the stuff that's covered in the seven sketches course, that's okay. Um, okay, and I'm not assuming that anyone knows what game theory is, um, but I'm going to explain that. So the idea of compositional game theory is we're going to be able to draw pictures that look like this, where um, here is a player. This player is choosing an element of set X. Here is another player who is independently choosing an element of set Y. And we're going to take these and we're going to feed them into a function, Q, which is going to be a function from x cross y to r squared, and we're going to get out a real number and not a real number, and then we're going to take these, and we're going to feed these strings back to these players, where oh, you have to do some slightly awkward string stuff. Okay. So we don't know what the other person got. Yes. So. Um, I'm going to define, or at least I'm going to mostly define, because I have to cut some corners to fit in the time, a, a category where, um, where the morphisms are games, and more generally open games. So an open game is like a game that's an open system, so it's a game that has a boundary through which it can communicate to the outside world, and then we're going to um, we're going to build games from these pieces by gluing them along these boundaries. So it's composition in a monoidal category. So I think we can draw pictures like this. So, so this is a string diagram that has nothing on the left and nothing on the right, which tells you that this represents an endomorphism of a monoidal unit. So this represents some, some morphism in this category that I haven't told you about, which is on the monoidal unit to itself. Um, and I can tell you up front that um, the endomorphisms of the monoidal unit in this category are going to turn out to be a pair consisting of a set, which I'll call sigma, and a subset, which I'll call E. And what these are is a set of strategy profiles. So this is something like all possible behaviors of the players in this game. And then the subset is going to pick out those which are Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium is a is a condition that you can put on a tuple of strategy on a tuple of strategies, which is called a strategy profile, um, which is kind of it's it's kind of non-self-defeating. It's you could think of it as mutually stable. So each choice for each player is optimal, given that the choices of all the other players have been fixed. So for this game, uh, so so this describes a family of games depending on which function you put in here. So these are called the bimatrix games. Um, so this, this, if you let x and y both be a two-element set, depending on how you choose q, you can get famous examples like Prisoner's Dilemma and Matching Pennies and Battle for Sexes and things like that, particularly. Um, and in general, um, so um, what this will end up being when you when you compute which morphism it is, it's going to end up being that um, sigma is going to be the set x cross y. 
So these are all the possible things that the players can do with no rationality constraints. And then D is going to be the subset consisting of the pairs x, y, given that, and then I'm going to write the condition to be a Nash equilibrium, given that x is optimal, so x is the argmax over all x primes of of Q fast projection. So, so this says that X is optimal, X optimizes the first output of Q given Y, and Y optimizes the second output of Q given X. Okay? So this is the general definition of a Nash equilibrium for a two-player simultaneous game. Um, I can give you some examples, and then that will be kind of most of the game theory that I'll need to cover. Um, so you let um, I'm going to I'm going to go wrong. I always go wrong when I have practical examples from practical um, actual concrete examples from game theory. Um, So you let x and y be two element sets, so C and D traditionally stand for cooperating defect. Um, and the prison's dilemma says that both players cooperate. Oh my goodness, what should this be? I should have looked this up before. Zero. Uh, both players cooperate, they're going to get. So, so, so defecting is going to be, so this should be 2, 2. Exactly one Nash equilibrium, which is DD. And this is interesting because if they play CC, uh, both players could proceed more, so they're kind of, kind of globally better. But game theory is in this world where, so if you're here, um, the first player would like to switch to D because then it would, because then the first output is going to increase from two to three. And also, the second player would like to switch to D because then the second output is switched from two to three. But if they both do it, then they get less. Uh, so so you, you, you compute these things kind of um, uh, point-wise. So each each individual thing should be optimal given that the other are fixed. That's, that's what an Nash equilibrium is. Um, the reason that this is interesting is that if you extend this to a probabilistic world, Nash proved in 1950 and won the Nobel Prize for showing that this always exists by the ground fixed book theorem. But also, if the other player is defecting, it's still better to defect. Uh, yes, that's true. <coughs> um, you can also come up with examples which have no Nash equilibrium and Nash equilibrium probability. And I'm not going to talk about probability in this talk, because that turns out to be possible, but significantly more complicated than category theory. Um, so for this, um, the basic counter example would be matching pennies, which is um, if uh, if they're the same, the first player gets a point and the second player gets nothing. And if they're different, the question, but is there any way to, to, I don't even know if this question makes sense to ask, does it make sense to ask the question about whether, that's a massive question, <laughs> um, whether there's a way to distinguish between, uh, so like, these are both by matrix games, so yeah. in, the, in the string diagram you have, they look the same, the string diagrams are the same, yeah, but the sorts of things that happen are very different, yes, is there well, any way to like get the sorts is, of things that happen to the, look the different? No, sadly. Or like so the, different the, the, shape, or the shape of the string diagram is the same, but we label this by function, so if you're given different names and the label's different. That's, mm -hmm. that's the best I can do. So, 
So, so game theory has a traditional um, graphical notation for games called the extensive form, where you draw the tree of all plays. Um, so this would be like um, C, D, uh, C, D, C, D, and then you have a, you put some equivalents, you put some dotted lines, like this says that the second player doesn't know if they're in this state or this state. Um, so there, there's an alternative. So this, this notation is more compact. It's, it's I claim better for some things. This might be a foolish question, or uh, this something. Is there a simple underlying concept of which this um, evaluation function is the embodiment, or are you saying that this defines a suitable Q, but I mean, is there a, an expression or a, 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 a basically a, a reason why these are the fun these are the, this is the function? Why these functions and not some others? Yeah. I don't know these are. I'm not sure. These are, these are old examples. Yes. How do you draw a state for a multi-stage game? Sorry? How do you draw a game that has state and that's multi-stage? I'll go to that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to that. So, so, this is, so, as a game, it's just this, right? I can give this game to you monolithically and you can analyze it. Um, but the morphism in this category, this is a composite because I can carve this string diagram up. Right. Um, so we start to see uh, pieces here. Oh, how do you do this one? Um, oh, that's a mess. You have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't do that very well, but you can you can carve up these this string diagram into individual generating pieces, and each of these um, defines or is defined by a a morphism in the category of open games. So these, so this thing as a whole is a game, but each of these pieces is an open game, and you can compose them together um, using the melodical category structure. Um, and and <coughs> you get this, you get this game composition from the pieces. So given given the pieces and the picture, the game falls out. That's what you get. Um, okay. I can now answer the other question, which is. We can, do, we can do more stuff than this. So, um, as the two-stage game, and the, the pictures continue to be intuitive. So, play one chooses the next, we're going to take two copies. So, typically, it's a monoidal category, so you have to keep explicit track of resources. We're going to use play one's choice twice, once in the payoff function, and once because player two is going to observe it. Um, I'm going to simplify the diagram by drawing this Q as a giant post state like that. It's just a bit different notation. Uh, inside this box, there's a function and some, and some bending. So now I've changed the type of player two. So player two is no longer a player making a decision in isolation, but they're, they're choosing a Y given an observation of an X. Um, and, and so this changes their type. This changes the player's type as well. So this is a sequential game? Yes, this is a sequential game of perfect information. Um, so the Nash equilibrium of this in general, um, sigma is x times the function set x times y, and the equilibria are x, f, given that um, x is in the argmax over x prime of q1 x prime f x prime and f of x is in you get the idea. Q to x r no that should be y y. Okay. So this describes um, so if any of you know game theory this is a Nash equilibrium not a sub game Nash equilibrium. Sub game craft equilibrium turns out to be the trick. Um, okay, and you can still carve up this, this uh, string diagram in the same way. Another thing we can do, for example, is let's say we don't want a type of information game, but an imperfect information one where, um, where player two has partial information to what player one did. We can insert a function here from x to some z. 
Z, I should say. So this could, um, so, so now player 2 doesn't observe F, but it uh, doesn't observe X exactly, but F of X. So typically in game theory, uh, you would put a, um, a, a, an equivalence relation on X, and then this would be the projection function onto the, onto the quotient. So Z, Z would be X over Twiddle, and this would be the projection. Okay, and this would change the corresponding way. Okay, that's the introduction. Now we have to get some serious stuff. Um, so I'm going to drop the definition. So, so I could give you this, the definition of this category all in one go, but it's extremely complicated. It's a very ad hoc category that's being engineered to do this. It's not a category that you just find lying around in nature. Um, it's not like coast bands of something or something kind of elegant like that. Um, so instead, the way I represent it nowadays is factor it into two pieces where um, each of the two pieces is a bit ad hoc, but less so. Okay. So the first category I'm going to tell you about is called lens. Um, category of lenses. So an object in this category is going to be a pair of sets, which I'll write x, s. I'll write it vertically because that's what I like to do. And a morphism from x, s to y, r. So I've written my indices a very weird way round. And the reason is because the definition of these morphisms is a weird way round. So such a morphism is a pair of functions, so a v sub lambda and a u sub lambda, where v is the easy one. V goes from x to y, so you've got a function forwards along the top. And u is weird because it goes from x times r to s. Okay, so that's very weird. So, is this even a category? Turns out it is even a category. You have to think of it to figure out its structure as a category. So, given, a, given an arbitrary object x, s, what should be the identity? So we need to go from x to x, that's the identity function, and we need to go from x times s to s, that's the projection. Okay, now the bum part. x, s, y, r, with some lambda, to z, q, with some mu. How do we compose these? So we want to get a lens from x, s to z, q. Well, along the top, we need to go from x to z. Well, we can go from x to y with v lambda, and we can go from y to z with v mu, so we can go from x to z. Along the bottom, you have to you have to do some fun stuff. So you're given an x and a q, and we need an s. So how do we get an s? Well, we can hit this x with v lambda to get a y. Now we have a y and a q. So we can get an r using u of mu. But we still have an x because we didn't forget about it. So using the x and the r, we can get an s. I could write that down, but I won't. Turns out, this is associative. And this projection is actually the units of it, and this does actually form a category. It's not obvious. Like, I don't think you can convince yourself that this is a category without doing the work and checking it, but it is a category. Um, it is, moreover, a monoidal category with essentially Cartesian on objects as Cartesian product point-wise on top and bottom, so x, s, 
times the sum x prime x prime is x times x prime s times x prime s. So sometimes I write s prime times s, and it is mildly more convenient. Um, and on morphism, the tensor of morphisms isn't that hard. You can stare at it and easily figure out what it should be. It's less difficult than horizontal composition. Now, so can I go back to string diagrams? So before I was drawing direct string diagrams. Um, so if I have a x, s, lambda going to y, q, the way I'm going to draw this as a string diagram is like this, where x and y are going forwards, r and s are going backwards, and that turns out to be a good way of thinking about kind of the information flow. Um, okay, so this category is, is a bit weird. It's, it's a monoidal category, so you can put these things side by side, and it's okay. Um, you, can, you can connect them together, everything's fine. Um, there's a couple of other things you can do. Um, given a function, given a function f from x to y, I can turn this into a lens in two different ways. I can turn it into a thing I'll call the f. Uh, I'll just I'll call it f again for a piece of by a piece of notation going from x one to y one. Namely, x to y along the top by f, and along the bottom we're going to one so it's unique. And there is another thing which I'll call f star. Um, which goes from 1x to 1y. Okay. From 1y to 1x, you said? Yes, yes, sorry, I just said that backwards. I was thinking backwards. So along the top, we're going from 1 to 1. And on, along the bottom, we're going from 1 times x to y. So it's just ahead. So in pictures, I'm going to draw this as a function, this as a box like this. Okay, so I'm starting to abuse notation. With string diagrams. String diagrams you abuse notation all the time, every day. It's just impossible not to, what you go and say. So this one is like, so this is like, um, okay, this is this, any forwards arrow, so, so this forwards arrow is like x, one and this backwards arrow is like one s and we we're tensoring them by putting them next to each other horizontally. So this is x times one, s times one, and then that this is equal to one s. Standard abuse when you do string diagrams. Um, so so when I'm missing these legs, that means that implicitly it works. Uh, this one is going to be Rotated, which, if you've ever seen any um, cash flow quantum mechanics, this is how you draw the. Do I get this the right way around? Transpose, I think, of a linear map? That might not be right. It might be something else. I get confused. Um, you see, I've just rotated it. So, we should put in the implicit one step. Stare at this, and you can stare at this, and they line up. Okay? And we also have a, for any set x, uh, where shall I go? Like, uh, here. For any set x, we have a special lens from x, x. 2, 1, 1. 1, 1 is, by the way, the number of units. Um, just because it's the unit set, it's our easy product from the top and bottom. Uh, which I'll call x1, or x. Namely, along the top, you go from x to 1, and um, which is unique. And then on the bottom, you go from x times 1 to x, which is identity. And I'm going to draw this like this. So this is like a cap in a compact closed category. So this 
this is uh, this is inspired by the string diagram notation for compactless categories. You see that. Um, on the other hand, if you try to come up with something like this, uh, one one two, x x, you find you can't do it. You can't you can't naturally come up with um, the morphism like this. So the symmetry breaks which is not that surprising because the definition is really weird. Um, and um, this, this, and this are related by a nice property, namely that for any function f, if I do this, and then I do an epsilon y, and then I'm that halfway through, so I have to. I haven't. I haven't got back to games yet. Uh, I still wait for at least five minutes. Um, but I want to give a an example of it. Okay, so, so I'll give you. I'll give you a couple of examples. So one is the kind of example that comes from computer science uh, programming, which is where the name lens comes from. Um, so let's say we have a um, uh, just a Cartesian product. Let's call it a. Uh, whatever, just call it x and y. But these are these are some particular sets that you can choose. So suppose we have a. Um, so the reason that this is called a lens is that you are zooming in on some aspect of this. So let's say you project out x so that the v the v is a projection. And now let's say this is some other some other set z. Now, what the u, so the u, I, I think I might have let slip without explaining it, but v and u, which is the forward and backwards map, stand for view and update. So view is, you're viewing some particular aspect of this. And then update is, if you replace the thing you viewed with a thing here, what do you get back? So if we, if we focus on the x but replace it with a z, you're going to get back an element of z times y. So you can, you can figure out what this should be. So, um, V of this goes from x times y to x as projection, and then U goes from x times y times z to z times y. And that's the only thing it can be. Um, so that's an example coming from, so, so programmers do this kind of thing all the time. Um, in Haskell, for example, to, to, to keep track of um, useful data. So the reason this is nice is that when you compose these together, this correctly propagates back the updates. So if you if you view something and then you view deeper into a piece of that in this big nested data structure, and then you do a destructive update in the middle, the, this composition law, which looks really weird, correctly propagates that update back to the outside. So this is why functional programs care about these things. A very different example. Um, which starts to smell a little bit like game theory is so I'm going to talk about Markov decision processes I mean without the Markov part so without probability because probability is hard um, but let's say we have a transition system um, so some some directed just just a directed graph uh, you probably need that everything has I won't explain the picture because I'll get it wrong. So, let's say we have a, a set of states that we can be in, and at each point in time we have a set of actions we can do. So, you should think of this like a, a, a transition system. So, at any point in time we're in a state, and then we have a, a fixed list of buttons we can press. 
and okay. So if we have a a function like this, uh, this is the basic definition of a transition system. So uh, given a state, we have a fixed list of buttons we can press, and in each state, pressing one of these buttons transitions you to a new state. Um, what I'm going to add is a real number. So each of these steps has a benefit to us. We get a profit from doing it. And the question is, so, so in a okay, in a market decision process, minus the probability, the question is we want to find a policy, which is to say a map saying in each state we're in, what button should be pressed. We're not allowed any memory, we're only allowed to be our current state, which maximizes the sum of these real numbers we're going to get. Okay? So to optimize, optimize for the profit we're getting. Um, except this process will run forever and this sum will diverge. So what we actually want to um, what we actually want to optimize is the is the decaying sum. We pick some we pick some value from zero one. So I'm about to write this down formally. So we start in sum sum q zero, that's our initial state, and then we have a q n plus one, uh, and we're given such a um, such a strategy, and then um, the state we're going to next is going to be the state. Just make the notation as I go. Yeah, that should be right. Um, of state we're currently in and the action that our strategy tells us to do. And then the value that we're optimizing is the decaying sum of the uh, g's that we get. Uh, g of q i sigma So if you allow this to be probabilistic, this is called the market decision process. And these come up in engineering and in economics. And you solve it using the Bellman, uh, what's it called? Bellman something. Using a method called um, dynamic programming. Um, yeah, Bellman principle of optimality. So you use the, um, the contraction matching theorem to, to show that um, the the optimal solution of this is the limit of picking something and iterating a certain functional on it. On, uh, functional from the Banach space of probabilistic functions from S to O. Something like that. You get the idea. Um, but I can turn this, so so this has a kind of game for flavor to it, although it only has a single player. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to model a single stage of this as a lens going from S along the top and R along the bottom uh, given, given, a fixed, given a fixed policy, namely the, the, the V part of this, I'm using V, uh, it's not this, is, um, is, the, is the new state that we get. Uh, so we're given a state here. So we're going to go from S to S. And this is, this is just the step function that we get given our policy. But the thing on the bottom is, so, so this says given the state we're in, and the profit that we get from all, the discounted profit we get from all future stages, what's the profit we get at this stage? And this, so given a Q and a thing called the continuation value, which I'll call R, um, this should be the profit we get from this stage, which is Q, your sigma Q, plus the continuation value discounted one time. So we, we we add an extra, so this, this multiplied by b re-indexes all of these by one state into the future, and then we add the correct solution. Okay. So I'm going 
going extremely slowly. This is, this is way too slow. Um, I'm not going to get to the definition of open game at this speed. Okay. If you let people ask questions along the way, you can have till 5.30. Oh, amazing. People are asking questions. Okay, if you have a question, ask it along the way. Don't hold it back. Okay. Well, I'm not getting at the, intu the intuition here. So it sounds like, so where does the sort of the expectation thing happen? Where um, some are summing all the sort of anticipated rewards? So, so the idea is if you... It's the composition. There's some composition. If you compose okay. infinitely many of these together, which is a tricky thing to talk about, what's right. the infinite composition in the category? Um, if you can, you end up with an infinite sum that ends up converging to this. Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to define two different functors from lens to set, and then those are the final pieces we need, and then I can tell you what's an open game. So the first one is called bold V. Um, so on an object, which is some X S, it tells you the thing on the thing on the top. And on a lens, it tells you the thing that the lens does along the top. Okay? So this is fairly obvious that this is a functor. Um, but it turns out, did you cover representable functors? You didn't, right? No. Okay, I don't imagine that's mentioned. Okay. If anyone knows what a rep representable functor is, um, this is the function represented by the binding model unit. If you don't, you can ignore that. Um, I'm going to, so, I'm going to define another, uh, another functor called k, and this one's contravariant. So this one is much more interesting. So this takes you to the set of functions from x to s, which I'll write like that. Okay. Now, um, given a lens from x s to y r, or lambda, we want to define a k of lambda, which goes from r to the y, X. What's it going to do? Okay, so let's say we're given some function here, which is okay. K. K stands for continuation because it's what programmers call it. So that's a function from y to r. Now we need to find a function from x to s, so let's suppose we're given an x. And now we need to produce an s. How can we get an s? Well, we can use u of lambda to get an s. If only we had an x and an r. Well, we have an x, this one. And we get an r, well, we have a function into r. So it's going to be k or something. k needs a y, and we get a y. Or we can get it by read lambda, given an x, and we have an x. So it's k of b and a might be enough brackets, but three, you want three, no. Okay. You have to check that this is a functor. This is, again, not obvious that it's a functor, but it turns out it is. Um, and it also turns out, if you still know what a representable functor is, that this is the contravariant function represented by the normal unit. So there's a, there's a secret duality between these two. Now I can tell you what local game is. Amazing. Now I can give you some examples. Enough examples to reconstruct at least some of the um, classical, like standard examples from the start by composition. Okay. I'm going to define a new category called category both games. Objects are going to be pairs of sets again. Okay. Now, a morphism from Fs to Yr is going to be a 
have open game. What's an open game? Well, it's a free tuple. It's a three pieces of data. The first one is a set called Sigma. This is a set of strategy profiles. A function which I'm going to write um, g sub blank, which is a function from the set sigma to the whole set in lens from xs to yr. Okay, so these two things to say it's the set of sigma and the sigma index set of lenses from xs to yr. And the third thing. E sub g is the equilibrium function. So this is a thing which, which is going to return a subset of sigma. But it has to depend on some stuff. And the stuff that it depends on turns out to be a V, X, S, and a K, Y, R. Which you can if unpack it, this thing is X and this thing is R to Y. So that's really weird. So that's the definition of an open game, and it's very hard to get intuition for it. Um, but I'm going to give you some examples. Um, well, the first example is any lens can be turned into an open game by choosing sigma equals 1. Um, so if we, if we pick our favorite lens from XS to YR, we have sigma being one of the sets. This picks out our favorite lens, and this thing, no matter what we give, it's just going to pick out the, the full subset. It's always going to pick out, it's always going to say the element of one is in the subset. I could also pick false if I wanted. You could, but that turns out not to be very useful. Okay. That, if you ever use that, it kills all your Nash equilibrium forever. Um, okay. So it turns out you only need two families of examples. One is those, one is the lenses, and the other is individual players. Of the individual player, has this form, namely, I shall call it P, I'll call it D for decision. So this is, this is not, so, not so much a player as a player making a decision. Um, so this goes from X. 1 to y r. Again, this is one. So all, all the players have this form. So that at the very beginning, I was drawing players that were making decisions without observing anything. So those have x equals 1, and this y vanishes. Um, how do I define this? So this, this one I'm going to define by hand. So by definition, sigma is going to be the set of functions from x to y. That is, a behavior of this player is a way to choose y given an x. Um, what should be d sub some sigma? So given a function from x to y, we have to produce a lens from x1 to y r. So which one is it going to be? Well, along the top, we have to go from x to y, so let's use sigma. And on the bottom, we're going into one, so it's unique. Um, so the thing along the top, so along the top, um, if you unpack it, really you get a function from sigma times x to y, right? So this says, um, given a strategy and the kind of initial state, the thing that your player observes. Run the strategy on the observation and make the choice that the strategy tells you to do. So when you unpack it like this, this says that your strategy is a way, a way to choose a y given an x. And then along the top, you actually observe some x and the y that you choose that you play. So this is the play function. Is the y given by sigma of x. Okay. 
So those are all of the individual kind of generating examples of broken games that you need. Things that are lenses and things that are players. Oh, I haven't told you the third fact. The third fact is important. So um, you need to produce a function like given an x and a function from y to the real, so we need a subset of x to y. And this is where maximization comes into it. Because maximization has to enter the picture somewhere. So given some x, k, we're going to get a set of sigmas from x. Sigmas such that in state x, you choose an optimal element of a. Okay. So when you say these are all you need, you mean to to get scheme theory? To get, get yes, together with equilibria and to, all. yes, together with the two composition operators of which I'm about to show you one and not the other one because that would take another fifteen minutes. Okay, so I told you that open games form a monoidal category, but so far I've just defined the objects in the morphisms and I haven't told you what composition is. So you have to do some serious work to define composition. Um, so I'm going to tell you what the categorical composition is. Oh, the identities, by the way, are the, th the things you get by lifting identity lenses in the way that I told you. So you pick sigma equals one. Those turn out to be the identities. Um, composition, I'm about to tell, you, to tell you what it is. The monoidal product takes a bit more work and I'm just going to have to skip it. You can ask me about it later or look it up in one of my papers. Or just done. <laughs> but you need you need both to recover basically anything. It's like you can't the, you, the only the only game that you can write without having tensor product is single player basing a function. So the player the player chooses an x in order to maximize its real number, and they choose the argmax, or they choose an argmax. The Nash equilibria are the argmaxes of this function. Um, that's, the, that's the only example that you can write without using tensor product. But I'm not going to take more tensor product because I don't have time. Okay. So, suppose we're given a pair of games like this. Okay. So, this is defined by four, four pieces of data, namely a sigma g, a g sub blank, and a p g. This is defined by a sigma h, an h sub blank, and an e h. And I need to tell you what the composition is. So e stands for equilibrium? Yes. The function would give, would give you the subset of sigma given these and b and k inputs. Okay, so sigma of g dash h is going to be Cartesian product sigma g times sigma h. So this tells you that unconstrained, a, a behavior of the composite of two games is a composite of one, is a behavior of one and a behavior of the other. Okay. Which lens should we associate? So when you play B and H, um, what behavior should we associate with? So so a, a strategy profile of, of this thing is a pair like this, where this is in sigma G and this is in sigma H. Well, we have a lens g sub sigma from xs to yr, and we have a lens h sub tau from yr to zq, and the composite is the lens composite is the lens one. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. And the last part, the kind of interesting bit. So. This is now why I told you about being K. This is really kind of useful. A 
by uh, sorry A C. Okay. So well, so this needs to be a subset of sigma g times sigma h. So it's going to turn out to be a Cartesian product of e g of something with e h of something. So in other words, to be an equilibrium in a composite, it suffices to be an equilibrium in one and an equilibrium in the other. Because equilibrium is like there does not exist a player that has incentives to deviate. So um, overall in a composite, there does not exist a player with incentive to deviate if there is not a player here and there is not a player here. But we have to adjust this thing, which is so this is called the context. So um, so the x tells you kind of what happened in the past, and the k tells you what's going to happen in the future. But we have to adjust it, because now we have to look at it from the perspective of g. And then afterwards we have to look at it from the perspective of h. So from the perspective of g, the past is kind of the same thing, but the future consists of this future after h has run. And for h, the future is the same thing, but the past consists of the past after g has run. Which is to say, this stays the same. In this case, it's the same, but now we have to adjust the other things, and it turns out a miracle happens that the correct thing is that the v functor applied to the lens um, g. Hang on, this isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't right. I lied when I said it was a Cartesian product. This is going to be the set of pairs. Sigma tau such that, here we go, now we're in the right place, such that sigma is an equilibrium of G and tau is an equilibrium of H. Now we're talking. Because now each player knows what the other knows, acts as though they know what the other one's going to do, which is the Nash equilibrium thing. So Just x using the v function using the lens. Uh, this is not right. This one is k, and we adjust it using h sub tau. And this one is x adjusted using g sub sigma. And if you stare at this, you see kind of cross because sigma is here and here and tau appears here and here, which is inevitable because Nash equilibrium has this kind of fixed quantity thing to it. Okay, and because you know that V and K is functors, you can stare at this and fairly quickly convince yourself that this is associative and therefore forms a category. Once you do it in this form, if you do it kind of raw without knowing about the category lens and these V and K functors, uh, this takes about 30 pages to prove that this is a normal category. The details see my thesis, um, but if you if you factor it in this way, you can essentially get you get the category part essentially immediately. The monoidal category part is only a little bit more. Um, so I had to I had to rush this at the end, um, but I told you what the generating pieces are, and I've told you the one of the two composition operators, and using that and the other one that I haven't told you. Um, so the, the well, order products and objects is the same, it's just cost using product element wise. Um, you can get back the examples at the beginning. So you can just draw a, stri draw a string diagram generated by the stuff, and then you can just turn the handle and calculate what it is, and then the theorem, which again is extremely tedious to prove, because you have to do game theory as well as classical theory at the same time, and they don't like each other. But you can prove that you get the right thing, that you get exactly the so there's a translation between extensive form and, and this form. They kind of have the same expressive power. Okay. No, no, why, why do you, sorry, I asked it wrong. I don't mean why do you claim that about this. I mean, um, why do you think that 
in trying to do game theory categorically, oh, you uh, end up with something that's yeah, like this as opposed to something. Is, that's that's a good, really good question. Um, I can I can hand wave about it. It's something to do with counterfactuals. So if if I if I ever give a talk that has some physicists in the audience, which if you're talking to categorical quantum mechanics people, it's plausible. I tell them the reason economics is, is in such a terrible state compared to physics is that they have to worry about counterfactuals, and counterfactuals are really hard. Um, where, is the counter, where are the counterfactuals so, there? So, so each player reasons Absolutely. in the form. So something is good because if they had done something else counterfactually, they would do less well. Physics doesn't have that feature. And I think that's the source of most of the weirdness. Huh. That's true. Not not this badly, I think. How is that the source of the weirdness? Sorry? How is that the source of the weirdness? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what is I think, Sorry. Yeah, I know. I, I, I think that's what I thought the answer was when I thought about it a couple of years ago. And I forgot why. What is the weirdness? Like, why is this a weird kind? Like, what I mean, is weird about this kind? I mean, it's not something that you'd naturally think of, right? So, for example, close bounds of finite sets turns out to be useful for systems theory, but it's also something that you might just come up with while playing around. I mean, but the axioms of the total are probably not like. Well, that's true. You like randomly happen upon without some serious <laughs> study. <laughs> okay. But, uh, is, do you consider that structure weird as well? Uh, maybe, but sheaves on topological spaces are. Not weird, or maybe they are weird. Neither are games. Anyway, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We have this discussion online. Yeah, and that's the subjective judgment whether something's weird or not. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay.